Hello, and welcome to RNR's Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Valerie King, RNR's editor in chief, and I'm joined today by four special guests on a very special topic you don't hear us chat about a lot here. So, what we're going to talk about is where cleaning and restoration meet biological terrorism. Now, the threat of bioterrorism has evolved for many from unthinkable to quite possible over the past several decades. And as we record this, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really reinforces the need to face the dangers of bioterrorism head on and prepare to respond should such an unfortunate scenario play out. So what exactly is bioterrorism and what on earth does this have to do with cleaning and restoration? That happens to be the focus of two back-to-back keynote presentations that are taking place at the 2022 Experience Conference and Exhibition, which is just around the corner. It's April 6th through 8th at the Duke Energy Convention Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Two of our guests today, Dr. George Buck and Jeff Jones, will be keynote pres- will be those keynote presenters. Now, doc- Dr. Buck's keynote is titled, What in the World? The Unpredictability of Terrorism. And that'll be followed by Jeff Jones' keynote titled Microbial Warfare 101. So without further ado, a warm welcome to Dr. George Buck, Jeff Jones, Jim Thompson, and Larry Cooper. All right, Larry, can you do the setting up of this roundtable more more justice than I did with more context as to why we're all here and what spurred this conversation? I don't know if I can do a better job than you did, but here's what I want the listeners to know. We've been talking about this for maybe 10 years, and Jeff will probably elaborate on that more. And we've been doing presentations at our show for about seven years. And it wasn't just on bioterrorism, it was pandemics or major national emergencies. And so over the last two years, we've gone through a pandemic, first time in our lifetimes. And the response was very interesting. Who was trained to respond? Who could respond? And what happened in my eyes anyway, was they turned to the cleaning, restoration, and remediation industry to respond. And we've been asking for at least seven years, are we trained, are we prepared? And my answer still is no. Generally, no, we're not prepared and we need to get prepared. We need to train people in how to properly protect themselves, how to properly use products and chemicals, whatever that response may be and how to uh, mitigate whatever the situation is properly and safely. And that training is vitally needed. So at our show in Cincinnati, I've invited Dr. Buck and Jeff Jones to be there to talk specifically about it. I'm thrilled that Jim Thompson is with us today also. Jim has a booth at our show. He'll be very active at the show, being able to answer questions and actively have dialogue about this. Um, But these guys are all experts in this area, which is really vitally important to this discussion. My role really is to help them bring forward their message to the industry. And thank you so much, Valerie, for having us uh, uh, with this opportunity to bring to the industry. Thank you, Larry, and all all four of you for being here to to share this information. Um, Before we dive into this discussion, I'm really eager to If we could just go around and you could all share a little bit about yourselves, particularly your backgrounds and experience as they relate to this discussion at hand. Well, good afternoon to all of you in the East Coast and um, wherever else you are. (laughs) Good big morning. Um, Again, uh, my name is Dr. George Buck. I've been a, um, my whole background has been firefighting. I was 14 years old when I started in the junior fire department. I'm a fourth generation firefighter and my son is now fifth. And I'm very proud of the legacies of our, our, our homes. But as I also joined the 101st Air, joined the Army, signed in the 101st Airborne Division, where I was an air rescue firefighter. We would call the dopes on the ropes. When somebody went down, we couldn't land. We had to repel down and, and rescue them. Um, so it was rewarding. Came right out of the service. And he got into the uh, civilian world, uh, firefighting. And I started specializing in um, hazardous materials. And back then in the 90s and all, there was no such thing as, you know, really dealing with biological terrorism. Uh, It was kind of like off on the side until 9-11. And I'm not bragging, but when I was a fireman, you know, we work one day on, two days off. Well, I was able to get my 
four degrees up to a doctorate degree while I worked as a fireman. And God works in mysterious ways. I took a medical injury from, in fact, the, the anniversary date was yesterday, St. Patty's Day, rescuing a person out of a car. And um, so then I, uh, I was offered a job at the University of South Florida, uh, which is here in Tampa. And I started, I was co-founder of the Center for Biological Terrorism Defense, the um, Center for Disaster Management and Humanitarian Action. And I also started at St. Pete College the National Terrorism Preparedness Institute. So I know how to spell terrorism. And it's been an uh, unbelievable ride so far. Um, my first book came out right after the Oklahoma bombing, mostly chemicals, uh, kinetic attack, things like that. Didn't even really touch um, biological, touched a little bit. But then um, I started writing a book on biological terrorism. And I actually sent it off to my publisher, November 2002. 2001. And it went like hotcakes. And I've written six other books. And I've lectured all over the world on terrorism, catastrophic disasters. And I've been to 48 nations working catastrophic disasters, 9-11 attacks, the attacks in Bali. Um, that's, that's the Evelyn Wood version of my background. Thank you, Dr. Buck. Definitely a storied career in this topic we're all here to talk about. Jeff, if you want to go. Sure. Hi, um, Jeff Jones here. I'm in my 53rd year in the cleaning and restoration industry. I got drafted in by my dad at a very young age, but I'm in my 51st year of forensic restoration. I cleaned up my first self-cessation suicide when I was 12 years old working beside my dad. And I found out that that was something that fascinated me. And uh, my father was very good at it and had a very professional demeanor and his skill sets and uh, were really off the chart. One of the things that we were working on, though, back then was how do we know this is clean? Sure, it looks clean, but, you know, dad was really bit involved in the cleaning and restoration industry. And so if we were looking at are there possible carcinogens and smoke? Sure. Are there possible pathogens in water loss scenarios? Absolutely. And, you know, depending on the category of water, the higher that probability gets. But are there pathogens uh, that we need to be aware of in any trauma or loss of life incident site? Absolutely. Well, we grew up in uh, my brother and I working beside my dad, and we were always trying to be better based on science. Sure, it looks clean, but is it clean? Well, like anybody else that grows up in their family's business, as soon as high school is over with, I'm gone, I'm out of there. I became the youngest person to attend the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia. I was a soldier. I'm a former SWAT team leader. I left that and became a consultant in the field of counterterrorism and executive protection and hung that up to come back and work for my family's restoration business and continue to move forward in forensic restoration. But because of what that I had been exposed to in my training, and back then we were looking at you know, conventional counter-terrorist operations, and you looked at groups from the Middle East, from Latin America, even Southeast Asia, like Shining Path, and um, we're looking at the possibilities there. But you know, back in um, the 80s, we started seeing uh, possibilities of bioterrorism. And, you know, in 1995, Tokyo suffered a sarin gas attack. And uh, that uh, made me think even more, what if, what if, what if? Because that's the same way we trained on counterterrorist teams. That's the same way we trained SWAT, amateurs trained till they get it right, professionals train till they can't get it wrong. So over the years, we've developed protocols and procedures for everything from um, bio risk level one to bio risk level five, and that's uh, mass casualties and bioterrorism. In um, 2019, my wife Lori and I were invited to Dubrovnik, Croatia, to speak at the Nuclear, Biological, Chemical, and Radiation Symposium. And we were the only cleaners there. These were scientists from all over the world. 
And we did a presentation on forensic restoration and its applications for bio risk level one all the way, all the way through to uh, bioterrorism. We were voted best presentation of the symposium because they were fascinated that people were already thinking ahead on how to neutralize or kill or inactivate an agent that might be used in a biological uh, weapon of mass destruction. All right. So more experience, totally relevant to this conversation. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. Excited to pull from that as we dive deeper. Jim, could you share a little bit about your background as it relates to bioterrorism, cleaning, restoration? I've been in the restoration industry since the late 70s. I was fascinated by hazmat before hazmat was cool. I was an EPA Superfund site supervisor in the early 80s. It didn't turn over until OSHA until 1991. I have taught a tremendous amount of OSHA hazmat courses as well as hazardous waste operations and emergency response. I am an OSHA authorized outreach trainer when it comes to disaster site workers, which deals with biological terrorism, nuclear terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, radiological terrorism. And basically I'm a restoration guy. I've been in the business for 40 plus years. My book is coming out at experience called My Life is One Disaster After Another. It deals with large losses, commercial losses, et cetera. Uh, my friends here and I have been talking this subject for a number of years. There's not many people you can sit down and talk to about a good anthrax attack or something like that. At a bar, people look at you, they call the FBI on you. Uh, what has happened with the, the COVID, I only had to COVID bail them out twice, so it's not bad. <laughs> You get to know them by name. Come on. Anyway, <laughs> with the COVID situation, it kind of fell onto us as like an unwanted bastard child onto the restoration. And people were calling me because I've been teaching for many years the disaster site workers course for OSHA, saying, what if there was an anthrax attack at Caesar's Palace? People would evacuate. Las Vegas would be a ghost town. The stock market would crash in two days. Then we have this Hunan virus come around that's, oh, it's not bad, it is bad, et cetera. And people in our business are being charging $3 a square foot to walk through with some $70,000 atomizer they bought from a paint store two days ago and going, oh, we've got to clean to this degree, et cetera. There is a way to do it correctly. My concern, and I know my colleague's concern is, the COVID was an envelope virus. Jeff will go into this. It's not that hard to clean. What happens if a smallpox happens? What happens if something where we walk in the door? I've never known of a person in a mold job to walk in and die walking out the door. It doesn't happen. Okay, you can't have a allergic and blah, blah, blah. However, we're dealing with something that you could take home to your kids. They could take to the nursery school. Next thing you know, you caused a major outbreak. The training is there. We can give the training. See us. Great setup. Okay, Larry, I do want to throw it back to you because we didn't exactly clarify your role in the industry and your background. So for those who don't know, I know they're probably few and far between within restoration and cleaning. Can you give us a little background on yourself? It'll be very short. I uh, started cleaning carpet when I was 15 years old, <laughs> and I started my own company at 18 years old. And I cleaned a lot of carpet and I also did a lot of restoration and remediation jobs. I don't claim to be an expert in this field. What my expertise is in is bringing people together and finding ways to solve problems and issues. I got very involved in writing standards for the industry and really I'm interested in the science and making sure that we're raising the bar wherever we can in our industry to save people's lives when we enter an environment and not cause damage. And so our training at the Experience Convention, uh, we're going on our 43rd convention coming up in Cincinnati. Our goal is to raise the bar and provide the best level of science and education possible whenever possible. At the same time, we offer a lot of entertainment as well as networking opportunities. So we as an industry can gather together and know each other so that when problems do arise, we know who to go to. 
you know, it's a fabulous industry. We have so much still to learn. Thanks so much for that, Larry. Okay, time to really, really talk bioterrorism. And before we really do that, we have to know what it is. So to set the stage, what is bioterrorism and how would you describe the history of it? Maybe we start with Dr. Buck. Well, it's pretty easy, especially here in the United States. Uh, the British were the first ones to introduce bioterrorism to the native Indians by giving uh, smallpox and do, uh, um, enlaced blankets which killed off a, a lot of population because they had no immunities. And it's the same thing that happened with COVID. We killed a lot of people. Now we've got, we're way over herd immunity because the United States is the only one that doesn't accept uh, natural antibodies as, you know, as, as a, a antivirus, basically. So um, the other thing you have to worry about with bioterrorism is that it, it's a psychological weapon. Yes, it does kill people. Um, but it's, it's also uh, a very political weapon, too, because everybody's scared of it. And if biological weapons were so good, you would always have um, foreign countries using them all the time. But it's really just the poor man's James Bond. Um, it's those type of countries. I mean, I can go in my bathtub and make botulism just from the local grocery stores and things like that. You can go to the same place to um, Home Depot. So biological is very easy to make. Um, it's very difficult to administer. So that's what the big, because if you do it in ultraviolet light, it's going to kill 50% of all the bacteria and, and toxins and things like that. So you've got you've to really look at it from a sensible point of view with biological terrorism, because we call biological terrorism a weapon of mass destruction. Technically in the lab, yes. We're out to reality, no, because we have the technology, we have the, the devices now, and now we've got the educated people. Um, you know, after 9-11, we had the Antbac scare. I was actually involved with some of the um, consulting with that with the US Postal Service, because the investigators, the Postal Service got into it because of um, it was mailed. So it becomes a federal offense by using, you put a stamp on it, becomes a federal offense. So. My definition of biological and terrorism is whatever the news media makes it out for that day's set of news. Um, for instance, you know, you look at bioterrorism. Um, we, the, the first real successful attack in modern time was up in the state of Washington, where you had a cult. They wanted to take over the local government. They made botulism. They, you know, little squirt bottles you buy for $1.79. Well, they filled them up and they had all their members go out to, his, to the um, salad bars and spray them so the population would be sick and they wouldn't be able to go out and vote. That's the type of biological terrorism uh, that is used on a small sense. Biological terrorism has been around for a long time. It's going to be around. But one thing we have to do is start setting up protocols and policies for what we call an emergency management all has its approach because everybody is... If you look at what happened just with COVID, nobody knew what to do. So what did they do? They reacted to everything, even though if it didn't work, like, like Jim was pointing out, walking through it an itemizer and just, okay, I'm done. $3 a square foot, write me a big couple of hundred thousand dollar check. And it didn't do anything. So we've got to learn how to standardize it. You, you, I'm not involved in your, your industry, but I am involved in cleanup because of my terrorism response and my hazardous materials response. But you need to set up policies, the training, and go into it, look at the worst case scenario, and then start to narrow it down. And I think the industry would do a lot better off than just total reaction. And other thing is, it's money, cost. So we have to start realistically looking at biological terrorism and also well, what's the difference between a toxin compared to a biological agent and things like that. Most people don't know that, even in this industry, from everything I've learned from Jim and other, other members of it. So that's, that's my two cents, I guess. Thank you for that, Dr. Buck. Really helpful sense of way back when to today and useful examples of how you think of bioterrorism. Before we move forward, any other thoughts from the group on bioterrorism? We're the answer to the problem. So do we have answers? Absolutely. And they were developed in the field by over 50 years of research that will work on anything. 
Um, okay, there, you know, there's five different types of um, bacteria that fall under the weaponized deal. Can we handle them? Absolutely. You know, there are chemicals that were designed and weaponized. Can we handle them? Absolutely. And there are things that are developed <clears throat> to do that just because though that you have that neutralizing agent or that disinfectant doesn't mean that you know how to properly use it. When uh, there, That always works in three parts. There's the delivery system or the sprayer, there's the neutralizing or disinfecting agent, and then there's the operator, and that's the most important thing right there. So has the operator been properly trained in how to handle his delivery system, and is that uh, what's being delivered, is that appropriate for that situation? And that's, that's where I, uh, what I was trying to say is that I don't know if your industry has a not national um, policy advisor committee where you can sit down, maybe experience can do this um, as, a, as a, a kickoff or something. Because I guarantee you, if I went to California and I did anthrax and I went to New York and did clean up an anthrax, it's going to be different policies, uh, even in your industry, because it happened in my industry. Really helpful. Just the fire service. Very helpful. Yeah. Good comment. Absolutely. What George said was it's the poor man's James Bond. It doesn't take a country to do this. An individual can do this. My point is we need to be ready to handle something, whether it be a major thing such as COVID or one person releasing botulism or something else. What happens if the local franchise gets called in on something that really is dangerous and they don't have the training to do it? You see, the, uh, the COVID wasn't all that dangerous as Jeff can go into details on, et cetera. If you're going in after some nasty thing, a small box or something like that, our, our guys need to be trained very well how to do it before they just walk in with their little sprayer and say, I've done it. Let me throw in one more thing. I, I've been doing some research over the last week about the industry and all. And you know, in a fire service, when we had a hazardous materials call, we went in, we plugged it, we decontaminated the local area, and we brought in a company to clean it up. And what you're going to have to deal with and think about in the future is that when you get a mass casualty incident, you got to go ahead and um, you're going to have a clean of fatalities or what do you do with them? I was actually just before the second Iraq war, I was on a conference. I went to Hawaii, tough place to have a meeting um, with the uh, World Health Organization. And we actually wrote up policies. What are we going to do with the fatalities that have been exposed to chemical and biological weapons? And are we going to bring those soldiers back? Or are we going to decontaminate right in the on, on in the, on Iraq? whether, you know, um, cremation or cleaning. So we had a policy for that. Thank you, I'm learning a lot. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty scary, too. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Pretty scary. You know, I, I think that was, I can easily say this, that 10 years ago, I'm having a discussion with uh, Larry and uh, I said, you know, I, I think everybody is missing the mark on this, that what we've got coming, what's, what's definitely on the wind is we're looking at the possibility of a global pandemic. And I don't think that our uh, industry is paying attention to that at all. With all due respect to the traditional restoration sciences, everyone was looking at the next new moisture meter or the next new extractor or this. And I was like, no, seriously, this is coming. In fact, the industry of the future will be in bio risk management and infection control. And some people looked at me like I was from Mars or had a third eye in the middle of my forehead. But Larry Cooper listened and, and um, I salute him for that. But it was trying to make headway with people uh, on biological threat and risk management on that. And at the same time, I was sitting and having a conversation with Jim Thompson. And we started having a conversation. He said, hey, with your background, have you thought about bioterrorism? I said, absolutely. And we started having a conversation. It was one of those where you had to stop and look, be careful about what you were saying, because that was on no one's radar 
at that time. And so we've been working on this for quite a while and uh, protocols and procedures, Dr. Buck, have been developed. And that was one of the things that we talked about in Dubrovnik, Croatia. And if I could just for a moment, let's just say that God forbid there was an incident. And so just like an incident of a homicide or a suicide, the cleaners are not uh, called in until the law enforcement is done or the investigation is completed. And then what you're left with is a biologically hostile environment. And so what's going to be the uh, goal of the forensic restoration team, that team of operators? First and foremost, you're going to need to uh, try to acquire as much critical incident data as you can. Who, what, where, when, how, we leave the whys off to law enforcement and the judicial system. But are we going after a bacterial, a virus, or a chemical intrusion into that micro environment, that man-built environment? Because with a bacteria, you're going to kill it. With a virus, you're going to inactivate it. And with a chemical agent, you're going to neutralize it. But the protocol is going to stay the same. We need to contain and control, then go in and pre-neutralize that pre-disinfect or uh, uh, if it's a bi if that's if it's a bacterial or pre-inactivated if it's a virus then we're going to have to through mechanical action we're going to have to remove that inactivated dead or neutralized agent and then we're going to have to have it tested and do a post remediation of either disinfecting or neutralizing or inactivation and that whole time the three major components of that, of any micro environment, are going to be structure, contents, and indoor air quality. And I think that Dr. Buck brought up a very real world possibility that we've got to look at is were there casualties inside this micro environment? And if so, a good basic understanding of human pathology is going to be necessary because if they've been down for a while, the deceased, this is how nature works. Human decomposition begins approximately four minutes after death. It's a lot faster than what we used to think that it was. In an average 200 pound body, there are 120 pounds of bodily fluids. These are going to go somewhere. There's between 1.2 and 1.5 gallons of blood. These are going to go somewhere. How have they affected the micro environment? So now we've got biologicals from the deceased, not to mention the intrusive agent of why we were called in to begin with. There's a lot of training out there. Jeff and I have talked about that. I trained for OSHA, et cetera, as well. When the, uh, when the uh, COVID hit, I drove 25,000 miles teaching nine 40-hour ASWAPers back to back, coast to coast. The minimum level of training for people potentially exposing an employee to a biological agent is the 40-hour hazardous waste operation and emergency response. And that we go into a lot of what is it, how bad is it, what PPE do we need, and how do we make sure we are decontaminated after we go into the, into the, um, the hot zone, so to speak. There is that training available. So what we're talking about, doesn't matter how bad and nasty the thing is within, within limits, it's the training of the people to know what they're going up against, to have it all planned out ahead of time. In the restoration business, we're John Wayne. We run in there with our pumps and our wet facts, and we do it all. When you're dealing with hazardous materials or a biological agent, you have to know exactly what you're going up against. What is your training needed? What is your PPE needed? What is your contamination reduction corridor? What's going to happen with it after you put it in the bag or after you've neutralized it? Etc. And this training is available. Jeff and I can give this. Well, my question about what Jim just said was it sounds like there are systems available for protecting workers that are going into these environments. They'll understand better how to protect themselves in and out, donning and doffing. The other part of that question then is are there currently products available? to help us neutralize, sanitize, whatever the word is I'm looking for that our industry can start working with to make sure they understand how to use them if they ever needed to. 
Absolutely, Larry, that's a great question. And, and there are, if that were to happen uh, this afternoon or tomorrow, I know exactly what I would reach for. You know, uh, during the height of COVID drama, there are over 500 products out there for this enveloped virus, okay? If we were to experience an incident of biological terrorism, you can write off over 500 products real fast. There's just a very small number of products or delivery systems that are designed to handle decontamination, neutralization, or to kill bacteria on that type of level. Uh, you know, um, personally, I would gravitate towards something from Sandia Labs uh, that uh, these were, uh, were developed for the military to neutralize biological agents out on the battlefield. But one of the things that uh, we've been working with and with them is that it's, it's not really smart to go in and to uh, neutralize a biological agent and then create a hazmat situation from your neutralization agent. So these are self-neutralizing uh, decontaminations that become eco-friendly and, and that's good. And that is part of the challenge of what happened with some of the products being sprayed for COVID is they did not clean them up. They left the residues behind and it caused secondary damage and still is causing secondary damage. You know, uh, Dr. Steve Cooper is really the father of modern electrostatic spraying. And Lori and I visited uh, one of his facilities in Athens, Georgia. And I mean, they had every so-called electrostatic delivery system there. And uh, he's got equipped that equipment that looks like Dr. Frankenstein's labs. So you're able to measure milliamps and everything from these delivery systems. But they were also had a section set aside for all of these products that were commonly used during uh, COVID-19 and how these products were affecting different surfaces. And it's not good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so Thank I am guys. hearing that we do have tools, but we're not ready because that came up a lot and training is important. So that leads me to my next question, which is really how do we get our level of readiness to where it needs to be? What training, what else maybe, what training is needed and what's available now on that uh, in that way? Well, let me say something, you know, um, there are five bio-risk levels. Bio-risk level one is simply the emission of any bodily fluid. That could be somebody gets a bloody nose or somebody leaves a used feminine napkin in a bathroom at Walgreens. They don't want their people touching biologicals. Bio-risk level two is any type of crime, trauma, death, uh, from a restorer's perspective that does not involve altering the structure. Bio-risk level three is we're gonna have to alter the structure, whether it's pulling carpet, cutting sheet wall, removing building materials, that's three. Four is the introduction of a known infectious agent and bio-risk level five is mass casualties and or bioterrorism. Now the protocol and procedures stay the same. You don't have to have a different protocol for one than you do bio-risk level five. It's just a matter of learning what are the protocols and procedures. If a trained operator will learn those and conduct themselves, let me be point blank honest, okay? Nobody ever took a martial arts class and said, I just want to beat up kids, old people, and drunks. No, that never happened. You train for your worst enemy, for your worst... Think Mike Tyson has con converted to a crazy man and he's going to attack you and your family. That's why you train. It's the same in forensic restoration. You train for the worst. And if it's not the worst, you'll be able to negotiate it. But if it is the worst and you have proper training, you have the proper tools uh, and you have the proper skill sets. OK, that's so important right there. When I say clean, I don't mean windshield wiper, uh, scrubby, scrubby, or any of that. My dad used to use a great tool. You know, Dr. Michael Berry said the cleaning is the removal of soil, both visible and invisible. Forensic cleaning is the removal of biological contaminants, both visible and invisible, to prepare surfaces 
for professional disinfecting. When you clean, what you really want to do is imagine sand on a table. And I ask you to remove the sand. And if we move that left to right with overlapping linear strokes and then deposit it, that's removing the contaminants. Now the disinfectant or neutralizing agent can do what we want it to do. If in the case of a bacterial infestation, what we would look at is an EPA registered hospital grade tuberculocidal disinfectant with a six log kill, proven to kill both gram negative, gram positive bacteria and inactivate both enveloped and non enveloped viruses. But when you get into spores, that's a whole new category right there. So you're going to have to have a sporicide. But if you were to get into something of an incident where there's a chemical, let's just say BX nerve gas very nasty stuff, stuff that we wish we had never invented. You're going to have to have a neutralizing agent that's designed to handle that. But the skill sets and the protocol remain the same. This is why it's so imperative that we have trained forensic operators out there. Listen, I don't like talking about me and I don't like to brag, but I'm just going to say this one time. There's not a pathogen on this planet I can't negotiate. But unfortunately, there's one of me and a small number of operators. What we need are more skilled, trained operators that understand protocol and procedures. If we're on an incident site and I've got teams in there working on an incident like this and the relief teams come up and I say, OK, I need you to go in and relieve that team in the northwest quadrant and they're on phase three. The last thing I want to hear is what's a quadrant? What's phase three? So that's why everybody has to be on the same page, the same marching orders. Hey, Dr. Buck, I, I know you're not tied directly to our industry and you're listening to this discussion from the outside perspective. What do you think of what Jeff's talking about? Do you have some other advice for our industry also? Well, Jeff kind of regurgitated everything that I was, not everything I was saying, but a lot of things I was saying about coming together with a strong group to lay out policies. So if um, Joe, Joe's R&R &R and Sandy's R&R &R too, across the country, they can go to one resource and say, oh, okay, this is a good training mechanism for us. Um, I, can, I can talk to people about it. I can share with my people. So they know what a quadrant is. Matter of fact, I didn't know what the quadrant was, so. <laughs> but th that's some of the things that you, you have to standardize. I mean, we do it in the fire service all the time. You know, we can like sprinkler systems for buildings. There's a whole volume on that, what it needs to do, what it has, you, and hazardous materials. What kind of level A are you going to go in? Are you going to go in with a C? Who, who knows? You know, it's, a, it's up to the, the event. At least everybody has a standardized. So you could go to um la and step right into the job or somebody else could just go in thank you thank you both for that thank you for the analogies jeff and for kind of tying that together in a bow dr buck i'm hearing that there are tools that exist there are products that exist there even are a lot of systems and protocols that exist but there is plenty of room for more awareness deep understanding through training and education to, to connect those dots across the industry. So there isn't just one or a handful of experts ready to respond to bioterrorism and that there is room potentially for more standardization. Um, is that an accurate, very, very short synopsis of how, where the state of things is right now? Let me say something. I'm on the IICRC standards committee and the vice chairman of the health and safety committee, the S-500 and all. But on my S-900, we are right now developing protocols and standards for illicit drug lag decontamination, including fentanyl, meth labs, et cetera. I don't know anyone at NCIICRC which has even talked about having a biological type of standards. What you're saying, I guess, George, uh, Dr. Buck, is we need at something like our level to have our own standards, such as we're doing with our S900, which is dealing with, we go into fentanyl, we might need to be in level A. We have to have HazWhopper 
prior to going in on drug labs. It's just, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's going to be in the standards. But there is nothing on biological except for RS520, which is a mold standard. And we're talking about something a little bit in a different quadrant. Where, where am I at here, George and, and Jeff? I agree. I mean, one thing you have to always remember, and we do it in fire service, is you have um, the cascading effect. You know, if you've got this incident, then all of a sudden you're decontaminating it. Now you find out that the decontamination fluid is worse than the incident itself. So those are the protocols you need to look at, you know, just basic research and, and finding out instead of just introducing like we did with COVID. You know, I mean, I, I, I shake my head every time I, I listen to COVID people talk about it, but it, we can, well, we're gonna, we'll be able to kill this virus. We can kill this virus. You can't kill viruses. But I mean, even Lysol puts down, kills COVID. No, no, it doesn't. It's just encapsulated Amen. in a dormant state. Amen. Thank you. Very interesting. Well, and it does sound to me like Valerie, the fire codes that I've seen and the strength of that organization, they've done an excellent job in having a unified document that everybody follows. And that sounds to me like this is where this area needs to go, whether it's a standard or some other type of document that's developed. So let's continue on. Yeah, this is great. Really fruitful discussion. So to layer onto that past question and topic, I'm curious, like we talked about the industry being thrust into situations, COVID more recently. How does the industry stay ahead, ahead, not behind or super reactive after being thrust into becoming experts when there really truly are not a lot? There are very few, as we've talked about. What is your take there? You have we to still have. have OSHA. We still have OSHA. I'm sorry, George, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. We still have OSHA, and George and I both teach uh, pass whopper classes, et cetera. OSHA has come up with a disaster site workers program, which is the 10-hour construction safety program that's used all over the country on construction because it's normal. The 40-hour has whopper, Hunters Waste Operations Emergency Response, which is the minimum level training needed for biological agents, chemical agents, radiological and the disaster site workers course, because going into a disaster zone is totally different than a normal working area. And that touches on biological terrorism, VX, nerve gas, et cetera, on uh, uh, chemicals and all. That is the overall principle, that is, that it's OSHA, that is above IICRC, that's over the entire thing. Now, but my point is they take the regular OSHA training that they have to have and bring in uh, uh, Jeff Jones and says, now we've got the overall training. Let's go after microorganism or biology, Jeff's area of expertise. The OSHA is how to safely get in, safely get out, set up contamination reduction corridor, where's the wind going, et cetera, the basics. But it's how to handle this. Jeff, that's, that's your expertise. Yeah. One thing I can suggest to your in, to our industry now that i'm getting involved in it is <laughs> welcome welcome by the way <laughs> thank you <laughs> is we Good to have you aboard <laughs> thank you I, i'm looking forward to working with you guys and i just thought uh, yes okay the the thing that we must have is imagination and people don't think in the imaginary world i was on the planning committees before 9-11 Nobody ever dreamed of flying a, um, two aircraft into the World Trade Centers the same day. We planned on one, but nobody planned on for the other one. So you got to develop not only um, standardized, you have to do learn how to do action planning. Because you know the, the battle plan goes out of the window when the first bullet is fired. Really helpful. So we're talking about the future now. We're talking about being more proactive, keeping with that theme. What, in your opinions, is next as far as these events of the unknown we're talking about, natural and man-made threats? Plus, what does that mean for the industry, of course? Well, let me talk with natural just for a moment, okay? Let's be honest. Mother Nature is a serial killer, and she is crazy, okay? She is constantly adapting. I love her, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fool her. 
I was in Mexico City a year ago, and I heard an address by uh, Michael Patterson, who had spent 14 years at Walter Reed Hospital. And he made this statement, and I'll never forget it, that according to the CDC, over 1,300 new pathogens are introduced into our environment every day. Think about that. OK, some of these die off quickly, some become benign and some start searching for ways to mutate and become stronger. That's thirteen hundred more today than there were yesterday. Infectious diseases have killed more people than all the wars in history combined. So let me go back to man made just for a moment. OK, 20 years ago, when we put boots on the ground in Afghanistan, it's a fact they had people working on biological WMDs. Those men were eliminated, those facilities were destroyed, and the Taliban fighters were sent to the hills where we engaged them for 20 years. Meanwhile, those facilities were built back better than they ever were with the hopes that when we turned uh, over Afghanistan to a provincial government, it'd be truth, justice, and the American way. It was never going to happen. In that 20 years, you've got two generations of educated Islamic fundamentalists growing up with a just raw hatred for the West. And where were they growing up and, and uh, uh, building up their um, skill sets? Where was Osama bin Laden killed? Pakistan. In August, when we did this strategic withdrawal, the United States got a communique from British MI6 and it said, you need to tighten up your security. Attack is imminent. Attack is imminent. Did we listen? No. 24 hours later, we lost 13 service members and a lot of Afghan civilians. In September, the United States got, and this is public record, um, a communique from British MI6 that says the United States has one to two years before you're hit with a biological weapon of mass destruction. Because now we've created a void in Afghanistan. Those educated fundamentalists have moved into Kabul and their new friends are the Chinese. On September 6th, Tony Blair issued a public statement that said the West is going to get hit. We've got to be looking out for biological weapons of mass destruction. OK, it's just training. It's training, getting ready for the storm that's coming just this morning. And I sent some of you guys this. This was just printed. It was an article by Dr. Tricia Tushlowski. I hope I pronounced her name right. Dark winter is coming. Are we prepared? And the whole article is on bioterrorism and getting ready for it. Wow. I'm going to introduce it to the conference, but see this packet right here? Yes. That's the hate directory of the United States, all the groups. And there's 25 in each page and what they hate. So these are some of the, the threats that we have to face, not just the, the, the mechanism that they're going to use for the terrorism, but just these are the groups. And there's a lot of them out there. Thank you. Yeah, this is just the United States. Those are the hate groups? Yeah, it's called the hate directory. Okay. Well, welcome to my world. Yeah, this is, I'm learning a ton, that's for sure. Yeah, that's well, as scary as all of this sounds, we want the audience to know that we're bringing this to our conference because we need to raise the bar in our understanding of what potentially could happen with bioterrorism and how our industry should start getting trained to be able to respond when we're asked to respond. We need to respond in a, in a responsible way. And so getting the proper OSHA training, getting additional training on systems and manipulating situations is critically important. And Valerie, I really wanna thank you for helping us get this information out to our industry and probably further uh, because it is critically important that we pay attention to this now, not afterwards. And, you know, having these three gentlemen on, uh, I just really want to thank each one of you. You all bring a certain level of expertise to our audience uh, that we have never experienced. And we're really excited to uh, have you at our show. 
and we'll continue this discussion following the show. So Valerie, thank you. Back to you. Yes, thank you all. This would not be happening without the four of you present and without your collaboration and expertise. Before we go, I want to ask Larry, uh, where can listeners go to connect with the experience and learn more about what's to come uh, the 6th through 8th of April? Plus, maybe dive into the descriptions of these keynotes as they relate to biological terrorism, cleaning, and restoration. Thank you. Uh, you can go to experiencetheevents.com and register there. Do a full registration because you're going to want to see these two keynotes. But then you'll also have an opportunity to go to our trade show hall where you'll be able to meet them and meet Jim as well and meet Valerie as well. Um, Dr. Buck will be talking about what in the world, the unpredictability of terrorism. And, you know, we've never done anything to this extent at our show, but I felt like it was critically important to bring this to the attention of our attendees and to the entire industry. There have been unprecedented type of terrorist attacks in the past, and we don't know what the future holds, but we should be prepared and we should be ready as an industry to be able to respond. And then the second keynote is on microbial warfare. And Jeff Jones is gonna lay a foundation of what infectious agents and pathogenic threats are, and how do we use sanitizing, disinfecting, sterilization, and inactivation of pathogenic threats? What does testing look like? And then, proven protocol when dealing with these biological hostile environments. How do we do the jobs? How do we do them safely? How do we close the job safely and make it safe for people to enter again? So really looking forward to this. And uh, this is on Thursday, April 7th in the afternoon. Uh, they'll be doing their presentation and can't wait to see you guys all just in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. All five of us will be here, will be there. So I'm excited to meet the crew and, and follow up in person. Um, I do want to give an opportunity for Dr. Buck, Jeff, and Jim, if you have any information in terms of a website or a LinkedIn or an email that you want to share in case viewers or listeners want to connect with you. Any takers on that? Well, I can share my email address. Um, it's UOF, as in University of, Hawaii, H-A-W-A-I-I, at gmail.com. Thank you, Dr. He's, Buck. He's just trying to make us jealous. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I go right. To there. <laughs> you know, I, I majored in Toga Party 101 and 102. So. <laughs> Jeff, any, any information we can take note of for listeners to connect with you? No, you know, instead of doing that, let me say this, that some of the stuff that we've talked about what would scare normal people don't live like that okay because when i said that there are ways to negotiate that i meant that do don't ever live your life in fear absolutely not we got this we just need more operators out there okay uh live your lives uh be happy and love those around you okay um we got this and one more thank note. you yes fear eliminates Fear, training, education, and practice eliminates fear. Knowledge, great... skill sets, and empowerment are right. what drives a microbial warrior. Exactly. Well, we got some strong closing notes, and I have a feeling there are a few more that you guys have up your sleeves if we had a few more hours. <laughs> Jim, I want to <laughs> hand it to you for any closing remarks and or how people can connect with you. Okay, honestly, guys, we're in the disaster business, okay? The more somebody's scared of something, the more they'll pay us. The more they pay us, the more trained, the more able we are to go in there and do it. This is something, all you need some training and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of guts and go in there and do it right, just like we do every day. It's just a different way to get trained. Largelossmarketing.com is my new book, Life is One Disaster After Another. We've got uh, George and Jeff, who will be at my booth, 103, one of the booths there. Come meet us, buy my book. George has his biological terrorism books. All you've got to do is get trained. That's all it is. Thank you again. Well, listeners and viewers, do not forget, mark your calendars for in-depth versions of this discussion, more than we've talked about. 
through those keynote presentations from Dr. Buck and Jeff starting at approximately 1 p.m. on Thursday, April 7th. For more insights on restoration, remediation, and the people behind it all, visit our website, randrmagonline.com, Apple, or Spotify, also YouTube. And if you haven't yet, please be sure to follow the podcast, and that's how you'll keep up with all of the latest episodes as they roll out. We're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, so we invite you to follow us on social too. This has been a very special edition of r and Ask the Expert. Thank you for listening.